uh, once here again to welcome you uh, all to the second part of the IF, 3G International Platform for Diversity and Equality in Astronautics, the IDEA program. So the importance of diversity has always been one of the core values of the International Astronautical Federation. And um, which was really also founded practically on uh, promoting the dialogue all over the world. So over the years, um, the sensitivity towards inclusiveness has grown and acquired focus and definition. And that uh, of certainly uh, appeals to all organizations. The IF Excellence in 3G Diversity Award represents an excellent example of the capacity of the Federation to bring its fundamental goals forward and also really to engage the whole space community uh, in its path. The award aims to recognize the IAF member organizations and also individual teams or projects for their outstanding uh, contribution um, uh, to foster geography, generation, gender diversity within the space se uh, sector. So in addition to the celebration of the 2022 IF Excellence in 3G Diversity Awardees, we would like to continue to offer the precious insights of our community concerning all the different possibilities that are more profound for inclusion of people with disabilities um, uh, for the whole space sector. So I'm particularly glad that the European Space Agency has accepted to present their groundbreaking para-astronaut feasibility project for all of you. But first, let me call on stage Anne Karen, uh, Chief Human Resource Officer at UTELSAT, one of the newest members of the Federation, uh, which has decided to start our cooperation by sponsoring today's luncheon. Please, Ms. Karen, join the stage. Thank you very much. I hope you will have a, a good lunch and I will not spoil it too long by um, introducing it, UTELSAT. And I would like first to thank you for hosting us as a new member as well. Um, and it's really an honor for me to uh, follow suit after this uh, introduction, although we will probably not get any awards this year um, from not being part earlier. So I'm the CHRO of UTEL South, and I would like to share a bit with you how much the 3G initiative of the um, IEC and the IF match exactly what we are doing at UTEL South and our core values. For those of you who know us better than me, I think it's always good to remember that UTELSAT was born diverse. It, it was just born, that's the way we were, we are. The geography, the multi-geography, the multi-political, those are at the root of UTELSAT. So those are our roots and we are very proud to keep them going in the future. Not only is UTELSAT diverse, by its roots and by its essence in terms of geography. But we also prove it every day by an open mind as broad as space itself. And that's really how we see it. And that's also an important driver of our diversity and inclusion policy across the group. Because we are a group with 50 nationalities or even more. It's changing every day. It's been up 24% over the last couple of years. So it's still growing. We're doing business and trading in 150 countries. We have 20 offices in various geographies as well. So this geography, this geographic span is a reality for us. And we are truly, in more sense than one, a connected community. And again, this is at the heart of our diversity because it's who we are but it's also at the heart of how we engage and improve our inclusion and inclusiveness along those aspects and for everyone. So I've given you a, num a few numbers, but I think there is one that is very dear to my heart as CHRO, because it's an everyday 
investment, not only by the HR team, but by every manager, every single person at Utilsat. And I'm proud that everyone can feel it among our teams, but also among our customers, industrial partners, institutions. It's the fact that we have 25% or more of our people who, are, who have two year or less seniority. So they are, we are attractive, we are attractive to people to join Utilsat. And that is extremely important because it's bringing the outside in, it's enriching us every day. And what I'm also equally proud of is that we have 16% of our people who have more than 20 years seniority. So they have stayed and stuck with UTLSAT, investing and enjoying working with us for more than 20 years. And that is massive. And I think it's an Im incredible talent that every one of us at UTLSAT have to make sure that we nurture internally our talent, our experts, we make them grow, we make them feel good for them to stay. And at the same time, because they, they themselves, they think outside of the box, we bring in new talents from the outside by remaining attractive and building a community. Of course, we have another challenge, and it's one of the Gs beyond the generations and the geographies. It's the gender. It's an industry-wide challenge. We are improving. We are not where I would like us to be with 33, one third of our workforce being women. The good news is not many of us can say that we have a female CEO. And you've seen her and heard her on Sunday in this forum. And we have a 50-50 XCOM um, member diversity as well between males and females. And we are quite proud and happy with it. And of course, that's the result of our everyday actions in hiring, in promoting, making sure that we have short lists that always systematically include talents of both genders on top of being highly competent. It's a discipline. It's an effort, not always easy and sometimes really challenging in very expert matters that our industry requires. But we manage it and we keep improving and those are our objectives. We also have a number of initiatives to make sure that we have the right environment for everyone to feel good. And in particular, women in the workplace when they are such a minority still in some areas. So we do um, um, have those initiatives like the trainings, awareness around um, the ordinary sexism in the company, in the workplace. It's not a nice word, but it's really a reality. It's the how we bring awareness to people to make sure that the perception of women, in most cases, can be offended by some actions which are very ordinary. Nothing really outrageous, but just the ordinary habits of how we do things. And we are fighting hard against that because that's how we show our commitment to people who really want to change and make th the place an equal place. I could go on for hours, really, but I know that we have a lot to exchange and I would like to hear you as well, very much. And I'm very curious to hear about the, um, I think the UK Space Agency Education and, uh, uh, and Skills team. Um, that there are a lot of things that we would like to, uh, to share. So thank you very much. We definitely need a stair here, yeah, because we always need a gallant gentleman, you know, to bring us down the stairs. So thank you very much, Mr. Chan. And uh, now let's move uh, forward to very revolutionary 
project developed by the European Space Agency, a long-standing supporter and member of the Federation. I invite to join me on stage the ESA Director of Human and Robotic Exploration, David Parker, who will present to you the ESA Para Astronaut Feasibility Project. Please join me on stage. Thank you, Pascal. Good afternoon, everyone. Are you having a good lunch? Great. Uh, thank you very much to, <laughs> to Pascal for the invitation to speak here today. And thank you also for, to UTELSAT for the sponsorship of the lunch. I hope to enjoy it very shortly. Um, I, I'm going to talk to you about this project, which is quite close to my heart, uh, the Power Astronaut Feasibility Project. I'm, I'm going to explain it in, in a rather personal way, so I hope you are OK with that. And I'm not going to give a project report, don't worry. There are no view graphs. There's just a very old picture of me, the way I used to look six or seven years ago. So where to start? Um, the first thing to say is that my knowledge of, of the breadth of issues facing people with disabilities or people with other abilities, if you prefer, is slightly less than my knowledge of how to play Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto. That's something I'd like to be able to do. Uh, and at least I've seen someone play Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto, but I have no experience of living with disability. Um, however, I, I do totally understand what it is part to be, uh, what it is, it is to be part of a minority, um, because I'm a nerd. Even worse, I'm a space policy nerd, and even worse, I'm a gay space policy nerd. So I'm in a really small demographic. I was, going to, I was going to go off an angle. Is there anyone in this, in this room that has seen the TV Netflix series Heartstopper? I'm looking to the, people, the young people over there. OK, so basically I'm a young Charlie Spring. Does that mean anything to you? Yeah, OK, I've got nods over there. Fine. We're, we're talking a separate language. Don't worry, I'll get back to you in a minute. Um, but the word I want to talk about really is representation. Uh, representation is what this project is about, and it's one element of tackling the diversity challenge that we all have, and all the different diversity issues that exist. Uh, right now, ESA astronaut who has, happens to have an Italian passport, Samantha Cristoforetti, is aboard the International Space Station, and in a few days' time, she will become the first European woman commander of the International Space Station. It's not that being an Italian... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> For us, it's very exciting. If I, uh, it's, the important point is not that she is a woman, it's just she's a very good astronaut who happens to be a woman. And it's the representation of her doing that job that is important. And so it is with representation of disabled people. Um, according to the World Health Organization, about 15% of the world's population are living with some form of disability, and of about 2 to 4% are living with significant difficulties in everyday life. In fact, almost everyone will live with some form of disability during your life, permanent or temporary. And people with disability uh, have been disproportionately affected during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, when people with disability access health care, they often experience stigma, uh, discrimination and receive poorer health care than, than people who don't have a disability. Now, in my career, um, I've often found myself challenging the status quo, asking why are things the way they are today? Uh, is it fair? Is it right? It doesn't always make me popular. But um, things like, why did the UK have a policy against human spaceflight for 20 years? Or um, why, does, why did ESA not have a single program of space exploration? Typical nerdy space policy issues, if you like. Now, I can't exactly remember where the idea of the para-astronaut project came from, and I don't uh, claim exclusive ownership, but um, a significant part of my career was spent making the case for human spaceflight in a UK context. And one of the justifications we always use is inspiration. We always talk about human spaceflight is really inspiring for the next generation. Isn't that great? Oh, absolutely it is. It's about human beings doing extraordinary things through personal commitment, self-sacrifice, and teamwork. And through inspiration, we hope to motivate, motivate the next generation into science, 
technology, engineering and maths, the skills that underpin our industry, the industry that we love. So in summary, we need more nerds. But I think there is a cognitive disconnect if we, the space community, keep saying this and then proceed to exclude, by definition, uh, the highest visibility part of the space activity, which is being an astronaut. It transmits a message of negative representation to lots of people who could perhaps join the space sector. Now, there are lots of good practical reasons, which astronauts like Pedro will understand, why historically astronauts with a disability have not been able to fly. But having problems to solve in this whole subject of, of uh, representation and uh, inclusiveness is not a reason to avoid trying to solve the problems. It's the very definition, actually, of space exploration. With this project, we're on a voyage of space exploration. So about four years ago, when they first started planning our uh, 2021 call for astronauts, we started talking about Project X, the idea of flying an astronaut with disability. And the regular astronaut project selection is a huge project by itself. So adding the complexity of trying to select the first para-astronaut was not an easy decision, us in-house and with the member states, especially when there are many unknowns and we actually don't know what the answers to the problems are. Some people said, well, it's a nice idea, David, but can we delay that and think about it a bit later? But the clue is in the name. The name is the para-astronaut project. It's by comparison with the Paralympic Games. The word Paralympic is two words stuck together. Olympic, obviously, relating to the Olympic Games. But the first part of it is not, some people think, paraplegic or, or paralyzed or something. It's para from the Greek preposition meaning beside or alongside. And the Paralympics are the parallel games of the Olympics and shows how the two worlds live together. And therefore, it was important for us that the para-astronaut project is launched alongside the selection of our astronauts. And uh, even though, we've, to be honest, we really didn't uh, starting a process without knowing what the outcome is going to be. But it is our goal to fly one or more people who are qualified in terms of aptitude, psychological aspects, to be crew members, but otherwise could not apply to the regular astronaut call on medical grounds. So it's this core goal of increasing inclusiveness by switching from a select out medical qualification model to a select in model based on the functional abilities and the managing the operational risks. So the first thing we did was do a realistic assessment and not set the bar too high. And some people have criticized us for not being completely open, but we, we talked and discussed with the Paralympic Committee, identified certain classes of disability were recognized by the Paralympic Committee that we think can credibly ad be addressed and the problems overcome during the project. So specifically, a lower limb deficiencies, people with a single or double foot deficiency or a single or double leg deficiency below the knee, people that maybe suffered trauma, have lost a, a since birth um, a leg or leg uh, length difference, or indeed people of short stature, people below 1.3 meters. And so we went out to, to call to the citizens of Europe, uh, member states, associated member states, and we had 257 individuals apply and entered the evaluation process. Now, I'm not going to tell you the exact numbers of where we are in the process now, but it's more than an order of magnitude less. So we're around about 10 people in the process now. I've had the opportunity to meet some of them very recently. They're extraordinary people. But throughout the project so far, we are pleased to have had very supportive feedback from the international space medicine community and from the US commercial space companies because we will have to fly uh, this person when selected aboard one of the US commercial crew vehicles. And uh, we've also had a very strong participation of NGOs, non-governmental organizations that have supported us in this process. And especially, we've had strong support from NASA and the other international partners in the discussion. So specifically, the clear interest of NASA has been shown by the, uh, uh, the NASA Office of the Chief Health and Medical Officers performing their own studies and reflections on the feasibility, comparing the, the possibilities of disability 
versus the activities in space. Is it possible? And so the ISS program management team have also been involved, and really a multidisciplinary study group is up and running and looking at the whole challenges. But NASA's overarching conclusion is this is an effort worth pursuing, and with the proper amount of planning and support, it can be fully successful. So much for the good news. But in closing, let me hint at some of the, the non-technical challenges which we are still facing. When I asked for a budget to start this project from our member states, I asked for two million euros. They said, hmm, don't know, you can have one million euros. So that's okay, they are paid to, to be cautious and to protect the taxpayers' money, I understand that. So far today, I have no budget specifically to implement the para-astronaut flight. Um, therefore, I cannot tell you definitively when it's going to happen. Uh, and maybe industry would like to help us in this. Maybe you would like to contribute to making this project happen. Uh, fine, my request. But more of a shock, I had a one-to-one -one discussion with a representative a, of a space agency in Europe a few weeks ago. And as you know, this whole selection process is ongoing for astronauts and the para-astronauts. And they kind of hinted, they didn't say it directly, but they kind of hinted that they would prefer for us to select for that particular country somebody that was not one of the disabled candidates, but somebody who was normally able, let's say. So if you don't think discrimination exists, I'm sorry, I'm here to tell you something a little bit different. But I also want to say the member states in general have been incredibly supportive of this project. And uh, the exchange and the reflection about representation and diversity just made us all much more determined. So whoever emerges from this process to take the project to the next step, to go forward with our feasibility project, I'm convinced that their involvement will be very important for representation. Representation then of disability not being a barrier to personal aspiration and achievement in space. And I hope representation that we, the space community, uh, what it should mean to those people living back here on Earth, irrespective of any issues of uh, diversity or inclusiveness. So we've got a long way to go. Please stay tuned and thank you and have a great IAC for me. Thank you very much, Dave, and for these very uh, really insights in, into this selection process and doing something really new. Uh, it is now my pleasure to welcome Anthony Tsukranis, the Vice President um, of, for Honors and Awards, to introduce the IAF Excellence in 3G Diversity Award for this year. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today as we celebrate the richness of diversity in our community and those at the forefront of helping us become even more inclusive and more diverse. Uh, gender, generation, and geography, the Federation's three Gs, are the cornerstone of the IAF's diversity program, uh, which of course does not stop there. Whether it's one of the three Gs, or race, or sexual orientation, or disability, visible or invisible, the rich tapestry of our space family is represented by all of us, and all of us can and do contribute in many different ways to the advancement of astronautics and the betterment of our societies. Uh, it is a matter of equity, it is a matter of fundamental human dignity, of access to opportunity and a career advancement, and also essential to the survival of the species. We are in a time of crisis, and we must muster all of our resources. Uh, we must leave no stone unturned. We must leave no perspective and no idea and no solution unexploited as human civilization faces so many challenges. So 
uh, in this context, embracing and capitalizing on our diversity of people and ideas, it is with great pleasure that I stand with you today to present the winners of the 2022 IF Excellence in 3G Diversity Award in each of our two categories, one devoted to organizations and the other devoted to single projects or teams within one of the IF members. <clears throat> I am now honored to call on stage the winner of the IF Excellence in 3G Diversity Award for the organization category, the National Space Science Agency of Bahrain. Represented here by its CEO, Dr. Mohamed al -Aseri. Please, Dr. al join us on stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Respected members and colleagues, IAF, IAF community, organizer of this event, I am on behalf of the National Space Science Agency of the Kingdom of Bahrain, I am honored to receive such an award in recognition of the achievement of the National Space Science Agency for the effort and commitment toward the 3G. And in front of you, I confirm that we will continue supporting the 3G diversity. And I have to share with you some good news that since we submitted our application for this award, and until last week, we increased the percentage of women in the National Space Science Agency, as well as of talented Bahraini youth in order to become the second generation of leading the space sector in the Kingdom of Bahrain. And with your support, I think we will succeed and will continue to raise the awareness at the national and regional level about the importance of the 3G and to bring every talented people disregarding the disability or they are normal people to work together with us to serve the space sector, not only for the region, but worldwide. And we'll continue supporting the enhancement of the science and to serve the humanity better. Thank you very much. Now let's move on to the second award. It is my pleasure to call on stage the winner of the IF Excellence in 3G Diversity Award for the Projects or Teams category. The UK Space Agency Education and Skills Team is being recognized for inspiring young people to pursue STEM careers and ensuring they have the skills and experience necessary to succeed in the field. The team is represented here by Maria Cody, head of ESA policy at the UK Space Agency. Please, Ms. Cody, join me on stage. Thank you, I'm uh, very touched and honored to be here. It, I, I feel a little bit of a fraud because it's not my efforts that are being uh, recognized here, but my colleagues back in the UK Space Agency. And I want to give a particular shout out to Ingmar Kalmagaran and Temi Sholiogola, who, uh, who have led this work. Now, a year ago, the UK Space Agency published a national space strategy. And since then, we've been working very hard, very diligently to implement that strategy. And one of the really strong pillars that we are putting in place is what we're calling our inspiration program. And I think we've already heard a lot about inspiration from uh, my colleague Dave Parker from the European Space Agency. And I think the real, the team have reported that actually space inspires young people so much and now they can all dream of becoming astronauts and para-astronauts and I think that is very powerful but beyond that we actually have to 
work really hard, and this is why we've put inspiration as one of our key policies to implement and programs to implement in the UK Space Agency, is because we don't want them just to dream of being astronauts and para-astronauts. We want them in, in every aspect of the space sector. I mean, if, if the COVID pandemic has uh, taught us anything, it's that space is going to be one of the real sectors to try and get us out of these difficult times. And it's the young people and the talents of all those young people who are going to enable us to do that. And the UK has, through its inspiration program, diversity is the DNA of that program. And not just because it's fair or it's equitable to look at diversity, but because it makes absolute economic sense. We are not going to achieve our goal of uh, space driving growth and uh, solving the economic problems that we're all facing in the post-COVID world, but unless we make every bit of talent in the sect account. So really, I just want to stand here and say and look forward to 10, 20 years and just hope that we can all do everything we can to get our young people aspiring to be the stars that we will celebrate at uh, the IAC in 10, 20 years. Thank you.